Dear Father and God, we have come together to worship you this morning. We know that you are with us, but we also know that the angels of the devil are standing by to interrupt us, to take our attention, to maybe make things not work, because the message that we give is a message of hope, a message of the future, and a message of a risen Savior. We ask that you'll be with us in this meeting. You will guide us, guide our minds, guide our understandings, and guide my speech for Christ's sake. Amen. Let me start, first of all, with something that's probably a little different here, and that is what I'm used to, which uh, would be a children's story. Uh, hang on a second. I've lost the Zoom part. I'm going to have to end this and come back. The Zoom, I have several screens here, and I have to move you over to a different screen here. Just a second. Um, okay, uh, just a second. I think we can do this now. Let's see here. For some reason, I think this is the one that should be right. Let's see if it comes up correctly. I don't think you're seeing the correct screen. For some reason, we're running into a little bit of a problem. I may need some assist here from... Uh, just a second, get rid of this. I think I've got too many things on. That may be where the trouble is. Yeah, let's see. All right, the presenter. Can you see the screen okay now? Children's story. Is that the one? That's the one. Okay. All right. This is the children's story. Anyone between the ages of three and 93 can listen. The rest can uh, close their eyes and take a nap, I guess. I have a grandmother. She was the daughter of a Baptist circuit riding preacher that became a Seventh-day Adventist. He went around the country every year, and what he did is they lived in Oklahoma because he was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian, and the mother and he and the five daughters would fill their wagon with personal items and a personal tent, and then there was a second tent that carried a big circus tent. It was big in those days, and today's it would be not that big probably. And they would go from town to town, and granddad would walk in to the bar. The bar was a place that was a restaurant. It was a saloon. They would hold church there. It was the only place big enough in a town, small towns. These are towns of maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 families, big enough to house everybody. And granddad would come up. He was not very tall. He was five foot tall. But like I said, he was a Cherokee Indian chief. And he would raise a $100 bill, which was more than the people were making in a year, and said, this $100 bill is available to the man who can come and prove to me at the tent I'm putting up outside of town that Sunday is the Sabbath. And every town he left, he left a church. D.F. Sturgeon was asked to stand during the camp meeting about 1935 in Oklahoma, and he was getting to the end of his life. And uh, they asked everybody that had been brought in by him or their family brought in to stand. And it was like two thirds of the whole conference. But this is how he would spend from the time he planted his crops in March until he came back to harvest them in October. And they traveled by covered wagon. This is a little more realistic picture of two wagons and how they traveled. It wasn't like you see in Hollywood. It was different. Grandpa and grandmother and the five daughters, my grandmother being the oldest, name was Janice, was traveling through an area in Oklahoma. Oklahoma is very flat. It's like the top of your table. There's not a lot of trees. The trees in Kansas and Nebraska and Oklahoma are not very plentiful. They're around hedgerows, but we don't have forests like you do here. Just some lone trees. I lived there for a while. 
about 20 years ago, about 40 years ago, I guess it was. But anyway, they would find a place where they could camp at night as he traveled from city to city. And this particular night, they came up to a farm and it obviously had a large, big fence that went around it, a very big fence. They saw nothing. So granddad, which was typical in those days, they opened the gate, closed and locked it, pulled their wagons up took their eight horses, each wagon was pulled by four horses, and pulled them around and got them all corralled and the horses set up to graze during the night and give them some water. They had their dinner. They ended up having their worship and they went to bed. They would sleep in the wagons, but if it wasn't raining, they would sleep outside on the ground on a mat and they were sleeping. In the morning, it was just beginning to get dusk, and they looked over, and this is what they saw. These are called Texas Longhorns. Those horns can be as much as 12 feet across. They're big, and they're not very nice cattle. I used to be around cattle that you would milk, and they were kind of friendly, and they were okay, a little skittish. But these are different. These are Texas Longhorns, and the Texas Longhorns? are for dinner. And so they got very concerned and the cattle were just slowly grazing. Quietly, granddad went and woke everybody up and said, be very quiet, move very, very slowly. Let's package up everything, quietly get it in. There's no breakfast, no nothing. We're going to hook the horses up and we're going to slowly leave because we know these cattle can get spooked and they will charge us. So grandmother and granddad and the daughters loaded everything, got the wagons ready. Aunt Minnie was put in charge of one wagon, grandmother and the other, and granddad basically got ready to run ahead to open the gate so they could let them out and then close the gate. Luckily, the gate swung inward so that the cattle couldn't bang onto it and knock it or loose and come out. So slowly, granddad began to walk, and grandmother, my grandmother, was sitting in the back of the last wagon looking at the cattle to warn them if anything began to happen. And suddenly, one of the big bulls began to come forward, and he didn't look too nice. He was quite scary. And another cow joined him, and they lowered their heads, and they began to walk a little faster. Grandmother and the wagons began to move faster and granddad began to run. And he got to the fence and he swung it open. You can see what the fence is like on the side. They're, they're big uh, posts in the ground that are many times concrete. And they're about eight inches thick with barbed wire. And suddenly the cattle began to bellow and stampede. Grandmother sitting on the back decided that praying was okay, but singing might be better. So grandmother started singing on the back. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below, knowing I shall see him. And so it goes on. And grandmother sang, the gate swung open, the gate closed, and the family was safe. And they were on to their next town, to raise another church. So while it's scary, think of grandmother. Think of her saying the so <clears throat> singing the song, Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. I don't know how old she was. She told me the story many times, and she has since gone on to her rest. I still have her Bible, and I periodically bring it out because it's very tattered, it's very worn. In fact, I have it here. Come to realize, I want to show you. This is grandmother's Bible. It normally is a special box in my office, but I brought it to my office here at the house because I've been wanting to read it lately. And this is grandmother's Bible. Where you see it was very expensive when grandmother had her Bible. You can see there are leaves. There's writing that grandmother has put in her Bible. 
And there are stories and things that she has written that are very important to her. So as you, as young children get older, I would encourage you to get a Bible. I would encourage you to read it. And I would encourage you to follow it. To mother and dad now, I'm going to ask you if you'll be quiet, because I need to take mother and dad on a very, very fast trip. It's going to be a trip where they need their seatbelts on. We need everything quiet. And we need to listen. The question I ask, can you go anywhere with safely with Jesus? We're in the middle of a pandemic. I have found out what that's like. Yes, I have both shots. I have medicine I take with me. I have everything ready for about anything that happens. I had to get a PCR test yesterday, which I'd forgotten, and I had to get it for a rush. I'm told what I have to do when I go into Singapore, and then I get on the plane, and it's 17 hours nonstop into Los Angeles, and then I'll be at Loma Linda. The driver is ready to pick me up at about 1030 at night. I land the same day I leave, by the way, because of the way the sun goes around the world. But I'm going into a place where everybody is scared. While the virus is dropping in the U.S. quite a bit, it's still a concern to many people. And yet we're living in a world where do we still believe in the Bible? Do we still believe in the Ten Commandments? Is Jesus really with us? Is this our goal? Is this what we want? Is this what we wait for? Today in our class, we discuss the fact of a covenant with God. And the covenant is his full grace. He forever has given up a spirit body to be only for all eternity in a human body. For all eternity. It would be like you suddenly saying, I'll be willing to be a paraplegic and never move again so I can save you. Because Christ will have limited by choice capabilities because he is now in a human body forever. And that's a big deal, a very big deal. You have to have faith that you believe him. And then there are rules. If I take you to the book at Jumbo Country Club, we have to wear a golf shirt. I went to a restaurant in Miami one day with some friends, Miami, Florida. And you're required to wear a suit jacket. I'd been giving lectures all day. I didn't want a suit jacket. And I said, sorry, I will not eat here. But you have to put on the suit jacket of God's Ten Commandments. It is as responsible today as it was then. So how will you get there? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And following his word and studying his word. And that's where we're going to go now. Because you see, heaven is way beyond the beauty of these gardens. And in that beautiful, beautiful heaven, there was one person who suddenly began to say, I'd rather do it my way. I think I know things God does not know. I think I'm smarter than God. He has missed things. So he went from angel to to angel in heaven. And he began to say, don't you think I should represent the angels? God's planning other worlds. And if I'm there, I can give him knowledge and I need to represent you. So I'd like for you to, to go with me and encourage God to say, yes, Lucifer, you should be in this, in this group. In the end, and I think at the beginning it was more, but in the end, one third decided they would join him. And they would challenge. And then we have the devil. And they were thrown out of heaven. And there was war in heaven. It was called war. That means meanness. That means horrible things. There was war in heaven. 
But the thing I want you to think of today is not the angel, not the devil, as it looks in the right, as a mean howling. He is going to be a glowing, shining angel when he comes to this earth to convince you that he is God. And today I want to warn you how to be prepared for that. Because he was a bright, shining angel then, and he will return that way again. His goal is not to help you, but to take you away from Christ and to take you with him to an eternity that doesn't exist and won't happen and will end. So now walk with me in a journey. Keep your seatbelts on because we're going to go very fast. We're going to go very far. For you see, the earth is about 6,000 years old. On the left is the story about 4,000 years ago of the creation, well, 4,000 4, BC, about 6,000 years ago, of the promise to Adam and Eve that you have sinned. You have now taken by choice the devil to rule your world. And if you don't understand that, we need to study that. The devil, in effect, ruled the world. When Christ came as a baby, he sat on top of the pinnacle, taken there by the devil, to say, I will give you this if you will worship me. Because Christ came as a human. He was a human. Yes, he had divinity, but he was human. And he was limited by human capabilities. But you see, Adam and Eve were promised that, yes, someday a Savior will come. And that's a promise that you can bank on. It will happen. During the time of about 2,000 years, the flood happened. And that probably was about 1,600 years, maybe 2,000 years. We don't know for certain. But the next person that came on the scene was Noah. And for 120 years, he built an ark, a boat. It had never been a boat. It was the first time they had a boat. But he, by faith, faced up to the ridicule faced up to the challenges that were going to happen around him. He and his sons and their wives, and they were the only hope of being ready to save from the flood. And the salvation of the flood restarted the earth again as we moved forward. After Noah, and not long after, Probably sometime in the area of just a couple of hundred years, Abraham came on, and he seemed to be a righteous man. He worshiped God, and God made a promise to him and said, I will make of you many nations. Abraham wasn't perfect. Abraham lied to two kings and said, this is my sister, not my wife, and they got in trouble, and they got angry with him. When it came time to bury his wife, he had to pay a lot of money to bury her. It wasn't cheap. His son Isaac had a wife, Rebecca. You remember the miracle story of how she was picked up by the servant that went up and found the right person and brought her to be Isaac's wife. And then you have Jacob, who basically stole his birthright from his brother and played a lot of games, but God still loved him. And then you had Joseph, who is an arrogant younger son, harassing the older boys, and they finally sold him off to be a slave in Egypt, who then saved Egypt. And the story goes now in some of the material that the actual salvation of maybe even up into China may have happened because of the ability of them to say, because it was a worldwide famine. But those patriarchs lived in faith to Jesus Christ. They saw a future that they could not see. The only sight they had was faith. And that's the only sight that sometimes you will have, or I will have. And that became a very, very big problem. Then we end up having Moses, which we've studied about, because they knew that there was going to be a leader born. Josephus says that there was one of the priests that went and told Pharaoh and became an expert for the Pharaoh, and that's why they killed all the baby boys. 
And so Moses was then taken at seven into the palace. Nobody talks much about that. If you read Josephus, we don't have anything in the Bible. It talks a lot about he was trained in the laws, in medicine, in religion, and in the army. What you may or may not know is he became a phenomenal general under the Pharaoh. He actually took the Ethiopians, came and challenged Egypt, and he led the army and had a great victory, which is well known, and military people still study his battle going into Ethiopia and winning. That, along with Christ being there, I think was one of the reasons he could walk in to the Pharaoh without question, because he was very, very famous in Egypt. They had hoped he would die in the battle because they knew he was part of the Israeli group. But instead, he lived, he won the battle, and then he had to run for his life. And God then had to change him for 40 years in the desert. And he became a very, very humble man, not realizing until later how valuable the simple rod he carried that God could turn into a miracle. But he saw the future of the Exodus people. He saw the future of how God was going to lead them. And remember, these are slaves. They had little knowledge, little education. But they trudged across the desert. They were taken through a phenomenal wall of water, which was a miracle. They were given manna every day, a miracle. They were given water that came beside them, a miracle. And yet, they regularly seemed to forget who God was. And then they became Israel. And over a much longer period of time, Kings came up, David, Mo, David, Solomon, and so forth. Then they digressed very badly from what God had told them. He told them, do not become part of what is around you. Be separate. Do not do the same. You need to read some of this. You'll read it in First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Samuel. You'll read some of those stories. I would like for you to read them. Then you have Jeremiah, Ezra, Daniel, and Esther, by the way, during this time. Phenomenal stories of God's blessing. So let's, let's go a little bit to the area that is called the Babylonian captivity, which happened, very interestingly, for the simple reason that many of them had idols. Today, when they dig up some of the remains of the villages during the time of the Jewish and Israel nations, they find inside many of the homes small idols to Baal and to Moloch and some of the other gods. And that explains why God says, I'm taking you into captivity and you're going to be there for a period of time. In Jeremiah 25, 9 to 12, we are told you'll be in captivity for 70 years. You will be in captivity for 70 years. That's where I want to spend a little bit more time because it has a lot more to do with us today. You can see the flood. You can see Adam and Seth and Enos and Cain and Methuselah and so forth. You can see Abraham and Isaac, but we'll look at the area called Daniel and Revelation, the time prophecies. For the Bible is very specific. Nostradamus is not specific. You find, find things about the Bible code and some of those things. Please don't spend your time there. Take the books and read them. If you need help, I'm trying to put together some material while I'm gone. I'll be resting a lot because my mother sleeps a lot, but I'll stay in her room as I visit with her. And I'll be trying to prepare some things. But Daniel and Revelation is something that you need very much to know. We'll talk more about that toward the end. But there are many time prophecies, and I'm going to show you, that are very, very specific. For you just saw the 70 years. And that happened starting in 605 BC. That is when Daniel was taken. And if you think it's well, they were marched. No, they were marched many times naked, men and women naked, or their, basically their clothes was curled up around their waist. 
So the bottom part of their body was made, was obvious. This was to, to humiliate them as they went and they traveled because it took them many months to leave Israel and walk all the way up north through Damascus and around over to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar in 605 had been defeating the Egyptians and had just returned and came into Jerusalem and took Jerusalem down, returned and destroyed the temple in 586, as you can see. But in 605, Nebuchadnezzar's father died and he had to make a mad dash across the desert to make sure he held on to his capital. So he arrived there within just a few weeks, whereas Daniel those basically it took, I think, several months, quite a few months to make that trip. In, nine, in 597, Ezekiel was taken captive. Now, by 539, the fall of Babylon is when basically Babylon fell and Medo-Persia took over. You'll also find in the Bible that Cyrus, under 536, he is specifically named 150 years before he was born by name. He's called Cyrus. My man is basically going to do my bidding. And he is the one who put out the decree to end the 70 years of captivity. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. To 70 years to end the captivity and to send the people back to build the temple. Darius again found that the claim had not been fully fulfilled and demanded and said, anyone who doesn't do it, I'll go after you. You give my money, my taxes, whatever. And the temple they built was gorgeous. It had gold in it, not as good as Solomon's, but it was a wonder of the world, even that one. And that was finished in 516. In Daniel, you'll find that it says when the decree is given to rebuild Jerusalem, not the temple, not the temple. That's what we just talked about. Artaxerxes gave the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, bring in the judges, rebuild the wall, make the city work as a city. Then we'll start the future. Now, by the way, going back to 605, when Daniel came in, we're going to look at what happened. Because Daniel, in the second chapter, the king was going to destroy all of the wise men. And Daniel was a wise man. You see, Daniel was brought in to be a eunuch. He's not a man anymore. He was brought in and he was trained to be a magician, a wise man, a knowledger. What they would do is they would take the entrails of an animal and throw it on the floor. And from that, they would read the future. And he was trained in all of this. And remember, by the way, he wouldn't eat the king's meat. He wanted to eat something else, vegetables. And God blessed him. Stop and realize in 10 days, he looked better than the other men. You can't do that on a diet today. You know. But God blessed him. And the king had a dream. He dreamed this gold, this image to the side, but he couldn't remember even the dream. So he said, if the wise man can't tell me what I dreamed and what it means, I'm going to kill a whole bunch of you. And so the soldier came to Daniel's house and said, come on, we're going to have to behead you today. And wait a minute. Hold on, folks. Hold on. Can I go to the king and ask him if I can pray to my God for an answer? Yeah, you could do that. So he went and asked the king. And the king says, okay. Then Daniel came back, and this is what Daniel saw. Daniel ended up seeing all of this. He said, oh, king, you're the gold. Following you is silver. And following you is bronze. And following you is iron. And then it's going to be clay. And then a stone is going to come and destroy this whole image and set up a mountain that will cover the whole God. And the stone is going to be Jesus Christ. And the kingdom is going to be God's kingdom. By the way, then in Daniel 7, Daniel himself got the same dream, but not with the image. Instead, it ends up being a lion, which, by the way, is a symbol. Go back and look at it. It's a symbol of Babylon that was used by the Babylonians. And he basically saw them as that. And then he saw the bear. That was Medo-Persia. And it was talking about raised up on one side and had three ribs. That are three kingdoms. That was, that was Babylon, Egypt, and Lydia. Those are the three kings which represent the three ribs in the mouth. And then the leopard, which was Greece that would follow. 
And when Greece followed, basically it had four wings representing four generals that would take over. And by the way, Alexander the Great, who led that battle all the way to India, there are still tribes in India. I've talked to the military people in India when I used to go there every year about those tribes. I wanted to go and I never did. These are tribes left. They're Aryan tribes. It's talked about in National Geographic even a few years ago. These are Aryan tribes that Alexander the Great left. He then came back to Babylon and died drunk because he'd, he'd conquered the whole world and he didn't know where to go. He had nothing to do, except one thing happened. When he came to Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, the priests decided that it was better to not fight him. So they took the, 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 uh, the parchments of Daniel and showed him where it was said there would be a great king that would come from, the, from Greece. And he immediately wanted to go into the temple and worship the God of heaven. Then Daniel had another dream on Daniel 8, which talks about the ram. This was already ending. Babylon was coming to its end. It was the third year of Belteshazzar. And then it was the ram, which is basically Medo-Persia, the goat. These, by the way, are different. These are sacrificial lambs, sacrificial items, and that has a whole separate meaning. And then we talk about the small horn, because it found out there was a beast with many horns, but one came up and it ruled the world. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And it grew up. So when Daniel 7 was finished, it says the court was set. The court in heaven was set. The court of heaven was set to judge all of us. And then when it was done, everlasting dominion, the everlasting gospel would be given to God to run the universe forever. And then in Daniel 8, it fin finishes up with the 2300-day prophecy, which I'll talk about a little bit. And then Daniel 11 goes into more detail about what happens at the end of time. For you see, when you read, if you get a little help and you begin to understand, you want the Bible to interpret the Bible, not somebody else. Be very careful. Many of the people misunderstand what the judgments really are, and they're very, very plain in the Bible. But it doesn't fit what people want to hear today. People want a God, which is a little bit like a genie. That God comes out of a thing and, what would you like? I will give you what you want. Or if you do everything, I will give you prosperity. God does not promise you prosperity. God doesn't promise you. He promises you, I will always be there, and I will take care of you. The prosperity gospel is sweeping America and the world right now. It is not a gospel you find in the Bible. God will take care of you, and he will help you. And sometimes he takes and brings people into great wealth. I have a friend of mine. I've told you about him before. He's one of the largest boat builders in the world. He has a phenomenal amount of money, and he's given it to God. If you go in the United States to buy snack cakes, you find Little Debbie's. The McKees were very good friends of mine. I know Ellsworth. I know many of the people. And that whole industry helps fund the Adventist church. Along with Sanitarium Foods, when you go to the store here, that's owned by the division in Australia. But you see, if you take a look, you will find the answers to many of your questions literally here as we go through prophecy. And now I'm going to take you on a fast trip through prophecies given by God. But remember, the Bible interprets the Bible. Remember, we just talked about the image. We talked about the gold and silver, and these are the years in which they transitioned. And you'll find those if you search in Google. Now, Christ was died here. And by the way, we're going to show that to you in a moment. But in 321 AD, that's after Christ, AD is not used so much anymore, but it should be. It's called after divinity. For the last 2,000 years, we've used BC before Christ and AD after divinity. But now it's BCE and so forth because people don't like the Christianity. So Constantine at the victory of Melvin Bridge, saw a cross in the sky. 
He then had crosses painted on everything that they had, and they won this battle. And as a result of that, Rome, which was pagan, suddenly began to be Christian, and it began to change with the Council of Nicaea to be Christian. And it became the official state religion in five in 380. By 429, the Theodosian Law Code was built of bringing all the laws together for the last 150 years or so and making them all cataloged so they had them, just like we do today, except 65 of them were decrees against heresy, one of which is called the Arian philosophy. The Arian philosophy is basically developed by a bishop in Alexandria, Egypt. The bishop in Alexandria, Egypt, the bishop in Alexandria, Egypt, believed that Christ was a created being, like an angel. He was not ready with the Godhead. And so a law was created that said that was heresy, and you could be killed for that. These three countries in 508, 509, basically came forward as Aryan. And you need to realize in five in 476, Rome died as a country. It no longer was the powerful Rome. Instead, the Bishop of Rome began to, began to be very involved. And with that, in 508, there was a king who came from one of the 10 tribes. His name is Clovis. He was the first king of France. This is France. The first king of France is Clovis. And Clovis came forward and basically fought this religious war and basically then began to support in the Synod of Orleans in 538, the reestablishment of old church laws and new ones. And that is when the beginning happened of what you today call the Catholic Church, or we begin to call the church state system. Because you see, there was no way to bring together the 10 tribes which it talks about here, the 10 toes would be the 10 tribes, and they came together. And so in 538, that is what happened. Now, if you go back to Daniel, and we're going to see that in a minute, I'm going to show you why these all become very, very important in the next slide. In the next slide, Daniel had this vision, and Daniel was dead by the time this started, but he had this vision about 550 A.D. B.C. 550 B.C. is when he had this vision, roughly. It's not exactly as close to that time. And he said in 457, which is when Alexander said, restore Jerusalem, not the temple. Restore Jerusalem. That came in 457. We know it specifically. It's well documented. It's not a question. And at that point, he gave a vision that had two meanings. One is called the Mara. And if you go back and read the Bible, you don't see Mara or Kadzon. You have to go back to the Hebrew, and it shows you Mara and Kadzon. And so you have the Mara. The Mara was for 490 years. And what that, in effect, said was that in, 430, in 34 AD, Christ would no longer look at the Israeli nation as his nation because Stephen was stoned. Three and a half years before, Christ was crucified. And three and a half years before that, that's basically seven years, Christ was baptized by John the Baptist. And you find those in Daniel, specific dates. So now we talked about the Christianity became part of the Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire died as such. Clovis, the king of the Franks, came forward and developed the Christianity with the Bishop of Rome, and then in 538 was the Synod passed, which demanded that the, the ruling power of Europe would be, in effect, the Roman church-state system. It was referred to by many as the Roman Greco Empire. The Kadzon was specifically stated by Daniel as 2,300 evenings and mornings, and in the Bible, in several places, it shows that the day-for-year prophecy is what applies. So, therefore, you know the 2,300 days are 2,300 years. Wow, that ends in 1844. That's not that long ago. In our time, it's about 180 years ago. 
don't remember the exact time, but somewhere in there. So this is basically what happens in that time. And then Daniel also at the end in chapter 12 said, blessed are those that maintain to the 1290 years or the 1335 years. Because what happens here is in 508, when this Clovis king came out, we know that what happened is 1335, there would be the beginning of the time of the end. In about 1755, if I remember the year, is when the huge Lisbon earthquake happened. It affected almost the whole world. Tidal waves, literally thousands and thousands of people died in Lisbon. at This massive earthquake. They had built a new jetty out of marble. People ran to that thinking they would be safe, and it collapsed. They ran into the cathedrals because this was All Saints Day, and they died in the cathedrals as they collapsed. It was not nice. That was in seven. And then you ended up having the day when the sun turned to, to blood red. Then you had a massive shower, showering. And then you ended up having what's called the dark day in New England, which no one to this day understands. But at 10 o'clock in the morning, everything suddenly began to go dark. Everything. The chickens went back to roost. The cows came to the barn. 10 o'clock in the morning. This, the, the Senate and the Congress that were meeting basically all went home. And no one could explain why there was a total dark day. Very interesting. People became very scared. Isaac Newton, who was very famous, read about all of this and talks about it. I'll try to get you some material if you'd like it. Martin Luther, who started the Lutheran Church, he also thought, Revelation could be taken out of the Bible. And then later in life, he studied it. And he became convinced of this. He became convinced of what was happening and where things were going. And so you end up having not one man, William Miller, who you need to study about. But you have many people. There was a very famous uh, missionary. I'm trying to think of his name now. It's Sunday. I didn't write it down. Fox, I believe, was his name. He traveled the world, including China, and took the world of the gospel of Jesus Christ to China. He grew up in a Jewish home and left because he realized who Christ was. And then with a little money, he, be, he traveled the world and talked and did a lot. And he began to see this. There were people in North Carolina, Chicago, Europe. It was not in one place. It was all over the world. Now, before I forget it, I need to show you one date that's very important. This is 1798. Now, if you don't believe me, I want you to take on your handphone afterwards, and I want you to punch in the date, 1798. 1798. Then I want you to punch in Pope, P-O-P-E, like the Catholic Pope. And then I want you to punch in Napoleon. What you're going to find, if you look, there'll be a few things that may come up with this. You're going to find that in 1798, General Berthier, under the, re, under the demands of Napoleon, captured the Pope and put him in jail, and he died there. And you'll find in Daniel that this is basically a wound that was given to the beast. We'll talk about that if you want to get into the study. But it goes into something much, much deeper. What I want you to realize is Christ does not lead you down a road that he does not show you and explain to you what is happening. You have everything there. Don't listen to others. Listen to your Bible alone. Your Bible alone. Now, I showed you this a moment ago. This now is exactly the same thing, comparing what happened with the Israeli people versus us. And this is the 2300 years. This is 457 when the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to 1844. So Clovis in 508 started the process. The church started in 538. In 1798, Berthier, the general for Napoleon, took the Pope Catholic, uh, the, the Pope in jail, and he died in prison. There were several others. In 1806, you see, all of Europe was ruled at that point, and it worked, 
by, in effect, the church-state religion. It ran everything. And by the way, you find in Daniel, the time, times, and half a times, 1260, that's well defined in Daniel 725. But you find it came to an end, and all of a sudden there was no central ruling power, like America or like the EU. EU, the central body, runs France, Germany, Belgium, and all of the European countries. They had nothing. They were all a bunch of tribes that had been basically run. For instance, if you got on a hand, there's a German king who got on a hand that the Pope made him come and stand in front of his, uh, his, his palace, his winter palace, for three days. He could have no covering and he couldn't, he had to stand barefoot in the snow. It's well documented. Martin Luther was involved. It was during his time. So during this transition time in 1831, all of a sudden, William Miller began to preach the message that you call the Seventh-day Adventist Church today and the three angels' message. This was the first angel. Another gentleman preached in 1843 the second angel's message, and now we're beginning to preach the third angel's message. I want to see you this little compilation. You'll see it a little bit more plainly here. But I want you to remember what you need to worry about today is the seal of God. The mark of the beast will happen. It's not good. But if you have the seal of God, you have the faith of Jesus. The seal of God is actually the counter of this. For you see, there is a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And you're going to end up having the devil and two beasts that are going to be a trinity that are going to bring forward the mark of the beast. And that is not all yet fully defined. We're learning more as time gets closer and closer to the end. I want to show you this is something I've started and I haven't completed. But if you look at all of the dates and you look at the years, I'm trying to put them together in text and everything so that you can have it. But I want you to listen to others, but I want you to be very careful. And here's the reason, and I'm going to show you. One of the things we all love is to put together things that we know and can trust. I know it's going to happen. I know, for instance, that my plane is going to leave Singapore at, at 7.30 tomorrow evening. And I know at 8.50 I'm going to arrive unless we get a bad headwind. And I know I'll be at my sister's house at midnight. We like those things. And so many people draw up time charts like this, and some of it is very good. For instance, there will be seven plagues. You can see what they are. But the time periods, we need to be very, very careful of what we expect. You need to remember the one thing you must know is you must study and understand what the seal of God is that will get you through. Because it's the seal of God that will bring you through this to spend time and eternity with Jesus Christ. For you see... We know what we know. And by the way, the Pharisees knew exactly when Christ was coming. They knew what was going to happen, but it didn't fit because they built a timetable exactly what should happen. And it didn't happen the way they thought. I'm not saying this isn't right. I'm not saying it is. I'm just simply saying you only get there, as one of the young men said earlier today in the prayer. You get there with getting up at five o'clock in the morning. You get up there with having your devotions. You read before you do that. You write a prayer journal. We can show you how to do that. And you begin to get very, very close to God. And you begin to learn exactly what is going to happen. Because it looks different when you get there. So therefore, this is a little bit of what ends up happening with us as we move forward. This is a picture in time, and we're getting very close to the point when all of a sudden we will find there are reasons that we need to study prophecy. Jesus recommends it. It demonstrates we are living in the end time. It will tell us to know what will happen. It helps us be ready. It helps us to increase our faith in God's word. It helps us to be blessed, and it prophesy, <clears throat> its prophecy points us directly to Jesus Christ. For you see, heaven was perfect. The devil brought sin. 
Adam and Eve did do sin. Israel was chosen as a nation, and they failed, sadly. And then all of a sudden in 18, 1800s, we begin to get the message we have now. And God says, I've given you a timetable to prove that I'm in control. In control. Daniel says in there that God puts rulers in place and removes them. I may not like Biden as the president, but I have to say God has allowed him to be there. Why? I don't know. Maybe I love him. Maybe I don't. But God is in charge. And God is always, always, always there. With that, look at Amos 3.7. Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. And then in Revelation, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservant the things which should soon take place. And he sent, communicated it by his angels to his bond servant John, who testified to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, for even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which is written for it, for the time is near. And remember, Revelation is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. The complete story of salvation is inside of Revelation and inside of Daniel. You need to study it and thoroughly understand it. For you see, Christ said in Matthew, Jesus came out of the temple and was going away with his disciples and came up to the point of the temple building to him. And he said to them, do you see these things? Truly, I say to you, not stone, one stone will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And later, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will happen and when will be the sign of your coming of the new age. Jesus wants you to know what's happening. He wants you to not be scared of the virus. Whether it's big or little or whatever it is, he is there. Period. End of story. He's there. You're not alone. You're not anywhere you can. Two things you can read if you would like to. Psalm Isaiah 53 and Psalms 149. This afternoon, enjoy that. Isaiah 53 and Psalms 149. I believe this is your goal, and this is where you want to end up. I believe this is what you want. I would like for each of you to very quietly, very quietly bow your heads. I'd like for no one to be looking. <clears throat> I grew up in a church <clears throat> in the United States, and in our church, it always ended with everyone bowing their head, and people would come forward. <clears throat> we cannot do that today, but I'm going to ask you in your heart, In the depth of your heart, what <clears throat> would you do? Will you join my friend at five o'clock in the morning for your devotions? Will you develop the things necessary to sit with the children, sit with the lion, and be ready? It's not easy. It's hard. Let me have our closing prayer. Dear Father, we ask that you will join us today. We ask for the quietness. We are in a world we do not understand. We do not know the pandemic. 
we do not know how it affects us. Bring each one of us close to you. Guide us and make us ready. And put us in the places we need to be, for Christ's sake. Amen.